Hi, everyone. This is Al Lowe here in Providence, Rhode Island, my home. I uh, wish I could be together, guys, in person for this meeting, but instead we'll have to do this virtually. Actually, one of my first virtual meetings, so I'll see how this goes. I'll be reading a couple notes, so you can see me flip down a little bit. These are my disclosures, but rather than throwing them up in one second and moving on, I want to review them a little bit because I think they're relevant to my perspective. So the views and perspectives presented today are those of my own and do not represent the views of Brown University, Eli Lilly and Company, nor the Mount Sinai Rehabilitation Hospital. I do not receive any royalties or financial compensation from any company that makes any rehabilitative devices. I am an employee of Eli Lilly. I'm a senior medical fellow in early clinical phase neurodegeneration and the clinical lead for ongoing phase two tr trials in Alzheimer's. For today's conference, I do not represent Eli Lilly. However, I do have a biopharm perspective or bias, if you want to call it that, regarding the development of therapies. I've spent five years now in pharma and previously 15 years as academic faculty. I'm on the Medical Rehabilitation Advisory Board and CMRR since 2019. So thank you for Ralph Nickin and Teresa Cruz for, for inviting me to that board. VAR and D and VA cooperative study supported research from the VA robotics trial and studies with locomat and multiple sclerosis. I've appreciated my 15 years in VA, but I am no longer with the VA. I'm the current president of the American Society for Neurorehabilitation. We've actually directed our members to go to this conference as we restructured our own meeting toward a spring schedule planned for April 7th and 9th, 2021. Obviously, I have a highly favorable bias for ASNR and the NR. And in our journal. So the overview are really in two parts. I originally wanted to focus more on translation from phase two to three, but with COVID at the forefront, it's relevant, I think, poses real opportunity to rethink clinical trials in a better way. My colleagues in the session will also cover more on early phase translation. This was a JAMA article. It came out pretty early in June, providing suggestions for best practice. There are also some very interesting data overviewing the magnitude of the problem. At the time this article was written, as of March 2020 on clinicaltrials.gov, there was 260,000 ongoing trials, 146,000 studying drugs or biologics, 85,000 on behavioral interventions, and 61,000 on surgical interventions or devices. COVID mitigations, which are self-isolation, avoidance of healthcare centers, interfere with all aspects of successful trials. So question could be, how do we keep trials going or should we just discontinue them altogether? Clearly, these trials are aimed toward benefits to patients so there are patients waiting and would lose any of that possible benefit. Continuing trials also waste contributions to patients and invested resources. So the authors recommended some dedicated resources toward creative methods. First, inform patients of what's happening. Second, to prioritize outcomes, which also means to reduce outcomes, and then move toward alternative methods to in-person collection. An interesting option they provided was statistical imputation. So if you miss in-person visits, say for a 400 meter walk, can you also use self-report in between to impute the data? They recommend alternative location for data collection and flexibility interventions. Another example they use, which is somewhat rehab-oriented, Exercise sessions temporarily converted to home-based sessions with remote monitoring. Essential in-person study visits should be modified for patients and site staff to reduce risk of disease exposure. And thinking about our research staff, these alternatives and, uh, and flexibility may also provide better work opportunities for them. So the FDA's credit, quickly, they've also provided guidance. This was in March 2020. They since updated it in September. And um, I'm not going to review the guidance in detail, but the point is that COVID was declared a major public emergency and a disruption to clinical trials and life in general. A word often used has been unprecedented. I think many of us wish we could just go back to just precedented. Uh, these are some bullet points which frame the problem in some high level guidance. A key point in this article is ensuring study participant safety and monitoring in both continuing or discontinuing because there are risks for both the continuing patients. For example, how do you monitor safety um, when you're using a drug with very limited data? However, there's also risks in discontinuing patients, for example, in oncology trials. 
To me, the point that is that FDA was trying to create opportunity for industry to thoughtfully come up with new solutions to salvage ongoing studies. And this include modification to outcome assessments and procedures to include remote or virtual evaluation, alternatives for investigational product administration, such as a home nurse. And they acknowledge that challenges in quarantines, travel limitations, site closures, and inter interruptions in the supply chain may, and this is putting it mildly, may lead to difficulties in meeting protocol-specific procedures, including administrating investigational product, adhering to protocol mandate visits, and laboratory diagnostic testing. With an ongoing trial, this amounts to <laughs> hundreds of thousands of protocol deviations. They recognize protocol modifications might be required. Patient safety is paramount. Administering IP safety monitoring and also additional monitoring, the participant cannot go back to the site or loses access to IP, um, potentially with some dangerous rebound effect uh, or changes in laboratory that could not be monitored. New processes and modification assessment procedures, uh, there needs to be some way to deal with missing data. And they offered a lot of consultations to modify efficacy endpoints and also their statistical uh, plan. Um, fr from this, essentially, I believe the FDA is inviting us to work with them to come up with solutions. The higher bar beyond rescuing the studies through mitigation plans is how to make future studies better to minimize emergency mitigation plans and amendments. I took this from an uh, online uh, recorded uh, meeting uh, among pharmaceutical industry individuals directly dealing with COVID. Um, and in my day job, I, I dealt with COVID quite a bit, so I can certainly vouch for the general sentiment. Um, the notion of normal has been forever chained to the clinical trial industry. Previously, activities viewed as risky as in-home participation and reduced source data verification are now viewed as risk mitigation strategies. The pandemic consolidated the need for a virtual trial, you know, somewhat of an aspirational goal. I think where consolidation is high focus on achieving uh, less in-person visits. Wearable devices and direct from patient data are now being implemented. Innovation is being deployed as a direct need for patient access, patient safety, and data integrity. There's an immediate need for telemedicine, remote monitoring, and in-home nurse visits. The FDA is supportive, so there was a collaborative and enabling environment. Improving a patient accessibility participating in trials is a priority of reducing burden. And this should be viewed as a new environment in which to operate, not simply a response to a, trans a, a transient virus. What I'd like for you to notice here is the movement toward immediate changes necessary for mitigation plans, which previously have been deemed risky or potentially not validated. This also identifies a global pressure and impotence to change right now. Here's a quote from Microsoft CEO, which captures this transformation of industry. We've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. The pharma industry is generally fairly conservative and risk averse, probably more conservative, larger the company. So although technology-based data capture has been circulating around as an exploratory tool for some time, that's primarily been a back burner issue or a choice for some very specific situations. However, the need has become hyper acute. A seller val validation, a seller validation, adoption of a decent centralized, although other words, remote outcome assessment for safety is needed right now. I believe beyond COVID, this will be an ongoing activity to evaluate and to pull in digital technology tools to, to validate. I guess this is one point where maybe industry differs from public funding agencies. Validating outcomes is not a highly novel activity, um, but it's very necessary to support this remote work. And this might be something uh, NIH may want to consider. There's a motivation toward more essentialism for protocols, where the most important outcomes are all these secondary and exploratory outcomes necessary Can we reduce them. How many study visits do we really need? If we have nine, can we live with six or five? Can we reduce or consolidate in-person visits? The reduction of patient burden, increased flexibility and accessibility, maybe hybrid models or clinic, a remote or home, uh, IP delivery and outcome assessments. Everything cannot be performed remotely, for example. And when I mean hybrid, some of this might be also based on patient choice as well, not just the external environment issue. 
the movement toward decentralization of conduct with trials makes things less clinically, clinical site centric and, and opens up opportunities in regions and geography. A question could be asked, have we experienced some scope or exploratory science creep toward more complexity in our clinical trials? Given the overall benefits, should all new trials be designed this way? We should focus on what is most important, most essential design, and the data needed to make decisions. Here are just a random public med search on telemedicine, ranging from smartphone monitoring, telephone assessments, virtual reality, and delivery of interventions. The point is the field has been expanding but generally this has been occurring at the periphery, usually a second choice used for exploratory data. There is, there's even a company, um, Stroke Mart, which has a cartoon, and I like that cartoon primarily, so I picked it. I think they're based in Germany and they've said they've moved their rehab program completely remotely to be able to perform at home. This really just points to the fact that some companies are already quickly adapting to a completely uh, tele or virtual visit setting. Obviously, everything cannot be done at home. Here on the left, you can see some interventions uh, that require in-person visits. Uh, that looks like an upper extremity robot. You see a couple of individuals there, maybe with exoskeleton and electrostimulation. Clearly, here we have a TMS unit, either for diagnostics, screening, or longitudinal assessments. The question is, can we take all this equipment and take it on the road with us? Perhaps not a 70s uh, Volkswagen van, but something nice and bigger in scale, maybe like a modified RV. Then we can go to where patients are rather than them coming to us. So the midpoint conclusion is the research environment has changed. We have to have the mindset that COVID will be here for a while or something else may happen affecting research. However, the other side has changed as well. The clinical environment has changed, a significant drop in outpatient rehab visits. There's been a 60% decline in outpatient visits between mid-February and mid-May. This is from a Jam Heart Health article. And the APTA has a fairly substantial COVID impact report found on their website. Um, very detailed information, but a couple of points is that 45% of physical therapy owners closed at some point during the pandemic due to professional judgment to reduce spread. 72% owners have had revenue losses exceeding 50%. Telemedicine transitioned from the exception of less than 10% use quickly to the rule. What this points to is a, neat, a new way to deliver clinical care is needed, and research activities need to support remote care. We can make all studies leaner, more patient-friendly, and flexible for delivery of therapy and outcome collection. There's an opportunity for creativity like no time ever. On ongoing studies, the immediate mitigation was for patient safety and ability to keep studies going. These generally are not cost-saving issues. However, in the future, a streamlined trial may actually be less costly and more resilient during a pandemic. If COVID enough alone was not enough of a disruptor, then we had George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and other actions that brought to the forefront inequalities, which also apply to healthcare. This is not an area of research area that I've done any research in, but a simple PubMed search will reveal all the infrastructure and the qualities that exist and are prevalent. Essentially, on the right side, what you see is COVID has exacerbated all of these inequalities. Although this is not an area of research for me, it is an issue I want to be able to address in research. As scientists, we generate data to support change in addition to our other social activities. In fact, for the ASNR journal, Neurorehabilitation and Repair, We've asked the editors to review what kind of articles can focus on this topic. Another notable issue is the general low level of participation among minorities. And Alzheimer's trials is 2% or less. We should make an intentional, we should make it intentional in trying to improve that level. Ultimately, we need participation and representation of minorities in consequential clinical trials. Does this shift the decentralization represent a dual opportunity? One is the streamline trials, and a second is to address DEI issues. What if we reduce patient burden for screening enrollment and improve access? What if we streamline study visits? What if we provide a flexibility for remote assessments and monitoring? What if we bring therapy and our collection of outcomes to the patient's location? Then can we address the clinical research and clinical need gap and increase participation and representation of minorities? Is a, word, is a question worth asking? Is a question worth testing? <laughs>
Now I'm moving to the second um, part of my talk. And, this, and you can see that there'll be some emphasis on patient selection. Here's a recent, uh, interesting recent paper, I believe it came out in 2019, which provides some reasons for failed translation. That's failed translation from table one on the left, failure to phase two, and on the right table, failure from phase two to three. And essentially when you boil everything down, it comes up to four points. One is poor understanding of mechanisms of action, which affects almost everything else. Second is the selection of the population of disease state that's appropriate for the mechanism of action. Three is dose and exposure, and four is the outcome. In particular, if you change two, three, or four, when you transition to phase two or two to three, oftentimes that creates increased risk or failure. Here I've highlighted a couple of things in terms of reducing disease heterogeneity, looking at predictive biomarkers, uh, looking at pharmacodynamic markers, which is much more prevalent in, in drug development, in order to select those, the use of adaptive studies, which may actually change some of the dosing or exposure, and basically using the same outcome in phase two to phase three. Oftentimes, many of our rehab trials, uh, initially there's a, a more of a surrogate or proposed surrogate marker, perhaps motor strength or some kind of range of motion. And then when the phase two or three comes, they switch quickly to a, a clinical outcome, maybe measuring capacity. I was a PI for the VA robotic study, which amazingly was published 10 years ago. Uh, it was very early days then. There were not a lot of examples of large rehab trials. Um, so what has happened since? What has changed? And what is the next future step? I think to the right is the RATLAS trial. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. This is published nine years after the VIA robotic study in 2019. and represents the latest iteration of the clinical trial for the in-motion MIT rehabilitation robots. It was a much uh, larger study, but let's look at some of the characteristics in detail. The VA Robotics enrolled between 2006 and 2008. The RATLAS study enrolled in 2014 to 2018, so twice as long enrolled, but pretty good given the much larger number of patients. Both studies use three groups, uh, robot, man, robot, some kind of manualized therapy, and usual care, uh, the manualized intensive comparison therapy in the VA robotic study mimicked the robot movements, whereas for the RATLAS study, the manual enhanced upper limb therapy was much closer to true uh, occupational therapy with goal setting um, and actually used a couple of rehabilitation trials. The dosing was fairly similar, 36 sessions for both studies, uh, 45 minutes uh, for the RATLAS study and about 60 minutes for the VA robotic study. The population for the VA robotic study was pre-open, basically any age beyond six months because we didn't have any data to indicate a cutoff. For the RATLAS study, they brought it down to one week and cut off the um, chronicity to, to five years. Our endpoint was a Fugelmeyer, which is more of an impairment motor control outcome at three months. And there was the ARAP, which is a capacity measure at three months. Um, VA robotic study was funded by the VRD, conducted in the U.S. Uh, the RATLAS study was a National Health Service study conducted in the U.K. They had a much larger number of patients who enrolled. Neither study had biomarkers or screening or to measure target engagement or for, for pharmacodynamic effects. In terms of efficacy, the VA robotic study this showed statistically significant improvement in robot over usual care. No difference between the two intensive therapies with a food monitor score of 2.88. In the RATLAS study, they actually detected, although all groups improved, there was no difference between the robot usual care or enhanced upper limb therapy. Interestingly, though, if you looked at um, the robot to usual care in terms of improvement, the food monitor was 2.454, so very similar, actually, to the VA robotic study. In our study, the VA robotic study, we looked at individual uh, change graphs we noticed very remarkable change among some individuals. And we performed a sub-analysis looking at predictive correlations. And this yielded some prognostic factors. Those who were younger, less than 55 years old, those who were less removed from their index stroke, 60 months, and even more so for 12 months, appeared to do better. 
Over the interval from 2010 until now, not only have there been quite a few more robot trials, there also have been some excellent, thoughtful commentary and views on the topic of robot, robot rehabilitation. Here are just a couple of examples. VBAC and Gerb Quackle did a review in 2008, followed up in 2017, and the conclusions are here. The effects on robot control are small, two points of Fugelmeyer, which is similar to what you just saw, and very specific to the joints targeted without generalization uh, to other limbs. There's no generalization of motor control to the, to the area of limb capacity. And they note that recent trials hardly differ um, from the 2008 reviews in terms of robot contact, lack of stratification, and outcomes used. And you see the similarities between the via robotic study and ratless study, with the exception of the outcome has changed. In our opinion, large variation in claimed effects between trials caused by differences in the selection of patients regarding characteristics of functional prognosis. On the right side, you see another article. This is published in 2020 by Kathy Stenier, Catherine Lang, Steve Zeiler, and Winston Bidlow. Uh, really an excellent article if you're interested. I, I try to reproduce this one table that might be, re might be difficult to read on the screen, but a virtual handbook on how to conduct clinical trials and strokes. And I would recommend reading this if this is an area of interest at all to you. So based on those two reviews, and what were the conclusions? In VBEC, they stated, in light of improving future phase two, three robotic trials, they better selected patients who are likely to cover, as well as fixed timing of baseline assessment, early post stroke key factors. In Stenier's page, paper, they also mentioned patient selection. Future trials could also incorporate predictive biomarkers to select patients who are most likely to respond. They cited the Everest example, which is an epidural motor cortex stimulation trial in stroke. In that post hoc analysis, they found patients with more functionally intact isolateral corpus contracts were more likely to have improvements. The, the authors of the Ratliff trial also commented that it is likely that the pragmatic inclusion criteria led to recruitment of some patients who had very little prospect of recovery. Future trials should consider advanced neural imaging and transcranial magnetic stimulation to improve the targeting of patients with the most potential to respond. So general comments and conclusions, VIA Robotics and Ratless are bookends for a 10-year period. The VIA Robotics was the first, quote, large trial, because uh, it's fairly small uh, by today's uh, standards. Um, but, that, but it was one of the first well-designed, impactful trials for robust training. This was designed even prior to seeing any kind of excite results. Uh, and lacking for parameters for patient selection, it was difficult even to find clinically meaningful differences for very, very many outcomes. So coming forward 10 more years, uh, frankly, I'm a little bit disappointed that the field hasn't moved on considerably more. The Ratliff trial was a much larger study, 770 versus 127. And I'm assuming the hypothesis was somewhat related to an ad adaptation of sample size that that would actually solve the, the initial problem in the VIA robotics study. But nevertheless, with a much larger sample size, there was very similar results in the outcome of Fugelmeyer two points in poor translation to capacity. The robot, the box they did not actually measure ARAP, but we did have some translation to the CIS and a little bit of trans, which is statistically significant, and some translation to the Wolf motor function test, which is not significant. Um, also, in terms of diversity, in terms of inclusion, the VH robotics study actually did fairly well. We had you have VA study, 18 to 30% non-white uh, and generally black to five-folds greater than Hispanics. The Rattler study actually did not report race as one of the, the demographics in their Lancet paper. Um, other couple other comments, enhanced upper limb therapy in the Rattler trial was more similar to clinical rehab, so much more pragmatic, you could say, if people chose to do that, although the primary objective would really appear to be to examine the robot rather than um, enhance upper extremity therapy. The robots themselves have not appeared to be revolutionary in terms of change. The hand units look to be very similar. I, I've not seen these new hand units, and I did not um, consult with anyone on that um, rattle study where they actually didn't uh, contact me. But it appears to be much more so kind of a constriction kind of a unit rather than something that, that extends the finger, fingers. The, frequent, the frequency of administration was nearly identical in both studies. The patient population have not been significantly different without screening strategies. The five-year cap may have included 
you know, less chronic patients for the addition of patients with one week since stroke may have uh, included more acute patients, potentially adding even more so to heterogeneity. I think in looking at these two studies and, and in the context of other rehab trials, I think rather than have the ambition to show pragmatic results, we should begin to focus on the best trials of test hypothesis that show that something works in a clearly defined population, although that might be a smaller population, and then once we have success, expand out from there. So in summary, I think my very simple view of the SA steps to the future, I think the first is sort of a combination therapy of which there is a, a major gap. Um, the combination therapy would combine a biological repair, reconstitution of neural tissue therapy, and combine that with rehabilitation to shape learning and restitution of functional opportunity, functional behavior. I think major research gap is in the area of repair and regeneration. With that, without that, all we have to work with is a person's central nervous system that is injured, uh, neuronal state. So patient selection, I believe, will be very important. In the meantime, prior to getting A, we can look at enriching our patient popul population for enrollment. Now we're turning a little bit back to COVID. Despite the simplicity of robots and some of the disadvantages, the difficulty, I think there may be some advantages during the life of the pandemic. They're certainly very compatible with a uh, virtually supervised environment. They're highly reproducible and delivering simple repetitive movements. And maybe that might be good enough to provide a potential base state of motor pattern coordination, which they can be receptive for more complex shaping, beginning skilled function, which may have to be done in, in person or much closer to the vision. I think with that, I, I thank you for listening. Um, I, I put up our annual conference coming up in April, and I'll be in St. Louis um, with Captain Lang as a, as a host um, chair, along with Louis Sweden as our ASNR research chair where it's going to be virtual. Um, I think we're gonna to move to a question and answer session uh, very shortly. Thank you.